um, topic may be a little odd for us as, as men to think about, but it, the church is described as being Christ's bride. See that over in Ephesians 5, and it's teaching us how to love our husbands as Christ so loved the church and gave himself for it. Um, and it was a very self-sacrificial love. And you know, while there's a lot of practical applications in that, the, the image that you know, remained and, and repeated through Scripture is that you know, Jesus um, is, is you know, engaged and married to the church, his bride. And, um, and so in that sense, um, I'm, the topic that's on my mind is, is our, our, our heavenly husband. Again, that's kind of weird as dudes to think about, but... Um, if you will, imagine if you were having a conversation with a little girl where she's, you know, still in that kind of cute age where she's willing to talk to you, um, but not, you know, you know, teenager yet. But, you know, you imagine, you know, that little six or seven year old kid and you ask her, you know, what would your perfect husband look like? You know, most of them who have watched any of the Disney movies. The first thing that pop out of their mouth is a prince, right? A prince. It's charming. Handsome, rich, strong, kind, sweet, loving. Um, the, the thing that comes to mind, I don't know if you've ever seen Fiddler on the Roof, but there's a song in there about the matchmaker. And the three daughters are um, you know, dreaming about what you know, kind of man he'll, she'll bring for him. You know, maybe someone important or maybe someone rich, you know, and for mama, make him rich as a king, and for Papa, make him a scholar, but for me, I wouldn't mind if he was as handsome as anything, you know, all those just kind of, uh, in one sense, silly, um, but in another sense, you know, very real, that's what they would uh, desire to have their husband, and the truth is, is that, you know, with us as the, the church, we have a heavenly husband, who is all that, and more, um, you want to talk about uh, how rich Christ is. And you could look in Psalm was it 50. Let's see if I have a note there. Psalm 50, verses uh, 10 through 12. The context is talking about how he doesn't need you know, the sacrifices of the, the Hebrews. Um, he says, For every beast of the forest is mine, the cattle upon a thousand hills. I know all the fowls of the mountains and the wild beasts of the field are mine. If I were hungry, I would not tell thee, for the world is mine and the fullness thereof. Everything in the world, the world itself, it's all his, it all, it's all God's. He's the creator. Um, it belongs to him. You cannot get any richer than that. Again, over in Psalm 24, it says, The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein. For he hath founded it upon the seas and established it upon the floods. Give you just a quick side note of a tangent. That idea of him founding the earth upon the seas and establishing upon the floods. You go back to Genesis and you've got this image, created the heavens and the earth, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the deep. So what he made first was just everything's covered by water. And then you have creation and the fall, and you have Noah um, where he hit the reset button and he sent it back to water. Right? Everything covered at water again. Well, when you come full circle to Revelation when the old heaven and the old earth had passed away, you have the new heaven and the new earth. You know what's not going to be there? The sea. So that changing, volatile, you know, unstable thing of the sea where it started and where the reset button went back to, and then in heaven, um, when it's all said and done, not even going to be, there's not going to be a sea. It's completely a tangent. It has nothing to do with a heavenly husband, but I just saw that verse and it reminded me of it. Um, Anyway, so the earth is the Lord's, the fullness thereof, and the world, they that dwell therein. So everything, all of creation, it all belongs to him. Everything that grows, everything that's, um, all the creatures, it's him. He's got it. He's, he's the riches it comes. And you may say, well, those are applying to God. What about Christ specifically? Well, you get that over in Colossians. Colossians chapter 1. Ephesians. Galatians and Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. I have memorized the books of the Bible with tunes or little kid songs, and you'll be amazed how many times I'll be standing up in the stand preaching and I'm having to sing that ditty to make sure I get the right book. Right. So, Colossians chapter 1, uh, verse 12. 
uh, giving thanks unto the Father, which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints of light, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness, translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son. Right? So that's the emphasis there, the dear Son, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. I'm talking about the Son, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. For by him were all things created. Christ was very active in creation. All things by him, or by him were all things created that are in heaven and in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created by him and for him. They're his. And he is before all things, and by him all things consist. He is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have prince. So we talk about you know your ideal husband, we're talking about um, wealth, he is the wealthiest, he is the richest. Right? What about um, you know, okay, you've got a rich guy, but if he's a total jerk and he beats you and he's awful, you know, that, that would that would be unpleasant, right? And well, not only is he rich, he's also kind and strong um hey miss deb we're talking about our jesus is our heavenly husband so we've just discussed where how um he's rich not only that but he's also getting into looking at where he is it's kind um and the verse that i'm thinking of here is in matthew chapter 11 um you're probably familiar with that and it's you know come unto me you're heavy laden um take my yoke upon you and i'll give you rest um Matthew 28, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in your heart, in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. All right? And that word uh, easy there, my yoke is easy, that is the same word in Greek that is used in um, First Corinthians chapter 13, you know, that, that's the love chapter. Love is patient. Love is kind. Kind and easy are the same word. And it means to be useful, to employed, to be better. That his yoke is better than anything else. Love is kind. It is love in action, right? And the image here is that not that he's handing you a yoke, you know, yoke or what you put on the animals to pull the burden, is that he's putting you in the yoke with him. Um, I was talking with a preacher the other day, and he had studied out you know, how you use oxen um, for drawing. And I have no idea. I've never plowed with an ox. But apparently you've got the one ox who's older and knows what he's doing and is trained well, and he's on the left, and he bears most of the burden. He plots the path and tells you know the other one who's learning of him how to do it. And so in this context, you know, Jesus is you know, there with us, but he's the one who knows where he's going. <laughs> he's pulling most of the burden, and you're coming along. That burden is, is light. That you're um, you know, being brought along with him as you're following him. You know, that he is meek and lowly um, in heart. And that that imagery there, you know, uh, in the world we have, you know, a lot of concepts are like, if you want to find enlightenment, you have to have this you know, massive journey. You've got to climb to the mountain and up there, you're going to find the little swami there and then he'll tell you and you've, you've earned the right to know about it if you make all this terrible journey or whatever. But that's not what Christ is describing that. He's there. He's already, I mean, lowly just means depressed, low down. He's acceptable, uh, accessible now, right where you are. And where, where are you? You're laboring and heavy laden as you're trying to pull your burden of your sins and your guilt and your load by yourself and you're trudged down in the mud and you're the dumb ox who doesn't know what he's doing and you can't carry it alone and saying come with me I mean, he's gentle and he's kind and he's there and he's helping I mean, this is you know all this you know a lot of different imagery here and it you know, may feel weird to talk about in the context of a husband but I couldn't think of a, a better concept of one who is gently leading doing the work doing the guiding and bringing you along um, so loving and kind and strong. Um, and you get this similar imagery about being a gentle protector um, in Psalm 23, right? It's a very familiar psalm. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my souls. He leadeth me in the path of righteousness for my name's sake. So in all this, you know, we're the imagery is that we're the, the flock, we're the young 
sh you know, sheep who needs the shepherd, and the shepherd is making sure that we are provided for. I shall not want, doesn't mean I don't um, you know, desire things, it means I'm not lacking. There's nothing that I need that he's not providing for me, whether it's the green pasture to rest in and to, to restore myself or to um, have the still waters. But he, he's the one who's sustaining us. And even though we're going through hard times in verse four, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I'll fear no evil. It's not saying you won't have hard times. No, it's saying that when you do, he's there with you and he's a protector. I fear no evil. You don't have to fear him because you've got the shepherd with you and he's got you know, the rod and the staff that for you, his rod and staff are gentle corrections where he's leading you back to the right path, making sure that the right spot, stop there, rest here, right? Gentle, soft. But those are the same rod and staff that he can bust over a wolf's head and destroy it like a rod of iron. That, you know, what's gentle to you as his child will just be an absolute devastation to one who tries to hinder you or hurt you, um, that you are ultimately, you know, protected. You think about the next verse, he prepares a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. All right, so you take your small children, you go down to the sketchiest part of town, and you set up a picnic. How confident are you in protecting your children? I wouldn't. But he's willing to prepare a whole feast. It's not just here, have some goldfish, we're going on. It's I'm setting up a whole feast. You sit here, you dine. I'm going to fill your cup up so full that it's overflowing. I'm going to anoint your head with oil. Very formal, everything you need. I've got it. I've got you protected. Even though your enemies can see you, they're really, you know, kind of like toothless lions. They cannot get you because I'm here. Um, Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord. I did a character study on the Lord a you know, while back, and there's goodness and mercy. Those are attributes of God. And so in that sense, it's like God himself, Jesus himself is following you, goodness and mercy, his goodness, his mercy. Um, not just some kind of theoretical, but him himself is following you. All right. So your heavenly husband, you're rich, he's kind, he's strong, he's gentle, he's a protector, very capable and confident. There's no one who can rattle him. Um, you know, we're talking about the characteristics of Prince Charming, right? They want to be handsome, right? Well, even in that, he's he's handsome. I mean, you can see that over in Psalm, uh, not Psalm, Song of Solomon, chapter 5. And there's going to be some kind of you know, weird illustrations that we don't easily relate to in our culture. Um, but what they're trying to communicate um, is every aspect of what is best, he is best. Um, so in Psalm, um, Song of Solomon, chapter 5, you know, your, your character here is um, the fairest among women, right? That's the bride, that's the church, right? And she's talking to the daughters of Jerusalem. She's looking for her, her lover, her um, beloved, and she said, you know, have you seen him? You know, and, and they answer back, you know, what is thy beloved uh, more than another beloved? She said, what makes your man so great? Um, what is thy beloved that another beloved that thou dost so charge us? And then the fairest among women in the church answers, my beloved is white and ruddy. I don't make that a, a race thing. That right and white means dazzling, or brilliant, glaring. And often you see um, bright illumination associated with the Lord. Um, uh, it's ruddy. His face is flushed or uh, rosy. The chiefest among 10,000. His head is of most fine gold. Most fine means a, a pure, like pure ore. There's, there's no impurity within it. It's like you took pure gold straight out of the ground. There was no mixing or smelting or anything. It's just perfect. And that's described in his head, his locks, or his hair is bushy, as black as a raven. You know, this is not, there's no imperfection there. Um, his eyes are as the eyes of doves by the rivers of waters, washed in milk and fitly set. What exactly that looks like, I don't know, but I suspect it's pretty. These little doves and milk washed and you know, things that are washed in milk. That's like a fancy way you wash up animals and make them look really nice and sitting in the background of rivers and it's just perfect. You know, describing his eyes and how brilliant they are. His cheeks are as a bed of spices, sweet flowers, his lips like lilies, dropping sweet smelling myrrh. You know, even his breath smells good. I mean, it's just over and over about describing you know, a physical appearance. His hands are as gold rings or beryl, his belly is as bright ivory overlaid with sapphires. 
legs are as pillars of marble. That's imagery of the strength there. Um, set up upon sockets of fine gold. His countenance or his face, his appearance is like Lebanon. Lebanon was the region known for just the best of the best. They had the best forest, the best cedars. That was what the temple would wound up being built on. So it's like just saying the absolute best that you can think of, he's that. Um, his mouth is most sweet. Yeah, he's altogether lovely. This is my beloved. This is my friend of daughters of Jerusalem. And that beloved means the object of affection and desire. And so um, the church, the bride, has a heavenly husband who is worthy of her ob as being her object of affection and desire. Um, so not only is he rich, kind, and strong, gentle, handsome, He's smart. You know, if he had all those things, it was dumb as a box of rocks, and you'd be kind of displeased with, with your husband. Well, he's smart. You know, in Matthew 12, 42, um, Jesus would talk about the, the queen of the south, Sheba, right, who came to visit Solomon because she hadn't heard about half the wisdom. You know, he said that she's going to rise up and condemn that generation then because a wiser than Solomon was there, referring to Christ himself. Gee, Solomon was given more wisdom than any man alive until Christ came. Um, and so, as far as, and, and he's God, he's all-knowing, omniscient, right? Omni, all science, knowledge, omniscient, all-knowing. Um, so he's smart and wise um, and has you know, perfect judgment. His ways and thoughts are so much higher than ours. Um, so you've got rich, kind, strong, protector, handsome, smart. What was, that like? what was the first thing I mentioned, you know? Someday my prince will come, right? That's how Cinderella ends, right? It's really a prince. Why do you want a prince? Because you want to be a princess, right? You want to be, you know, value treated with royalty, all that silliness. Well, Christ is royalty. He is the royalty. Um, you can see how he answers Pilate um, when he's being you know, interrogated and brought before him. The Jews are demanding that he be crucified. And John 18 uh, in verse 33, he asks him, this is Pilate, art thou the king of the Jews? And Jesus answered, saying, Sayest thou this thing of thyself, or did others tell it of me? So he doesn't answer his question. Pilate answered, said, Am I a Jew? Thine own nation and the chief priests have delivered thee unto me. What hast thou done? Jesus answered. Right? Then he, he answers the first question. My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then would my servants fight that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now is my kingdom not from hence. Okay? Now is my kingdom not from hence. At that point, it wasn't. But when he returns in his glory, he's coming back. He's bringing his very visible um, kingdom uh, with him. Right? Um, and that's kind of the idea that's uh, manifested in the parable over in Luke chapter 19 um, about the, uh, the nobleman who goes to a far country. Now, the parable is about the ten talents, right? He lives some with him, some with him, some with him. He's supposed to do work while it goes. Well, the intro to that says a certain nobleman went into a far country to receive to himself a kingdom and to return. And he called his ten servants and delivered the, the talents and said, Occupy till I come. But his, but his citizens hated him and sent a message after him saying, we will not have this man to reign over us. And when it came to pass that he was returned, having received the kingdom, then he commanded those servants to come and he'd give an account of how they used the talents. And he dealt with all that in the very end. It says, but those mine enemies, which would not that I should reign over them, bring hither and slay them before me. And so, Yes, there's the admonition for us as using the talents that we've been given to our master's glory, um, using them profitably while he's gone, but the idea is that he's gone to receive his kingdom and he's coming back. And there's those who hate him, have no desire for him to rule over him. He still rules over him, I said overall, um, but at the final judgment, he'll deal with that. Um, but that's what he's gone to to receive that kingdom and then, then to return. So that's that's imagery looking to, to Christ and um, and then later over in Pentecost, you would have the uh, Apostle Peter um, getting up and giving this, this, this sermon, you know, really bringing down the hammer in one sense about who it was that they've crucified and killed by wicked hands. Um, and kind of culminates it with that, no, assuredly, 
that God hath made the same Jesus, the one that they killed, um, the same Jesus whom ye have crucified, this is Acts 2 and verse 36, whom ye have crucified both Lord and Christ. Now the Christ, um, they knew that was synonymous with a king. Now, what did the wise men say when they came to Herod? Where is he that is born king of the Jews? Herod goes and asks his wise folks and the priests, where is the Christ going to be born? They say Bethlehem in Judea. It was synonymous in prophecy that Christ was going to be the descendant of David, and he was going to have his kingdom, and he was going to rule forever. And so when you say anyway, that Christ is, you know, Jesus is the Christ. He is the Messiah. He is the anointed one of God. He is the king. He, he definitively is a king, but Lord and Christ, Lord meaning master, the ruler. All right, uh, and then let's go over to 1 Corinthians and talk about you know, living and reigning now. 1 Corinthians, let's just jump in at verse 20. And the context of this is that there are some within the Corinthian church who didn't believe in the resurrection at all. And Paul is just lambasting them for being so stupid that if you don't believe the resurrection is, you know, a resurrection is real, then Christ hasn't you know, been resurrected. And then your faith is in vain because all of it depends on Christ being resurrected. Um, and so he had, you know, kind of gone through their their mistaken doctrine and blown it up. And then now in verse 20, he says, but now Christ, but now is Christ risen. So he's affirming the truth, is risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. For since by man came death, referring to Adam and the sin in the garden, by man also came resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die. One has sin, thanks to Adam, original sin, passed down, total depravity, even as in Christ shall all be made alive. So everyone is going to have eternal life by Christ. That is not all going to have eternal life in heaven, but they will all be a resurrection. But every man in his own order. Christ, the first fruits, afterwards they that are Christ at his coming. Then come at the end, when he shall have delivered up the kingdom to the Father, even the Father when he shall put down all rule and all authority and power, for he must reign till he hath put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. So at that point is when he's going to tender the kingdom to God, the Father, saying, all right, here it is. It's completed. The last enemy was death, for he hath put all things under his feet. All right, and just for the sake of time, we'll jump down to verse 50 of the same chapter. It says, Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood can't inherit the kingdom of God, neither doth corruption inherit incorruption. Right, so our mortal corruptible bodies can't inherit the kingdom of God. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. So there will be those children of God who are still alive when Jesus comes back. Um, and everyone's going to be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, where the last trump shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible. And we shall be changed. So those that are dead are going to be raised up with incorruptible bodies. And then those who are still alive will be changed immediately. Um, for this corruptible must put on incorruption. This mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall put on incorruption and this mortal shall put on immortality, then shall it be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin and the strength of sin the law but thanks be to god which giveth us the glory through our lord jesus christ so that's when that final enemy is going to be put on it under his feet when death is swallowed up in victory that final trump that's when it all gets wrapped up all right but in the meantime we're back in verse 20 said he must reign till he has put all enemies under his feet so he is actively reigning now okay all right first timothy Still looking at the royalty and you know his um, kingship. First Timothy chapter six, verse thirteen. Uh, I give thee charge in the sight of God, who quickeneth all things, before Christ Jesus, who before Pontius Pilate gave a witness to good confession, that thou keep this commandment without spot, unrebukable, until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. Which, all right? So we're talking about him coming back. Which in his times he shall show who is the blessed and only potentate, the king of kings and the lord of lords. So in his time, he's going to reveal it. It's a manifestation. It's a revealing. It's a showing. He already is the only blessed and potentate, potentate being the, the absolute ruler. Right? Um, this is where we get 
um, omnipotent, all powerful, all powerful, so the powerful ruler, the king of kings. And you know, it's kind of weird in our culture, we don't think about tiers of kings. Um, but if you look in the Old Testament about when these empires would come and whoop up on somebody, they'd have the top king, and then underneath them, they'd have the kings that they left alive that are still underneath them, kind of like living trophies. You, know, you may have 130 kings, and they sometimes they chop off their finger and their big toe, or their thumb and their big toe is a symbol of, yeah, you've been defeated. And so there's multiple kings within the kingdom, but there is the king. And so here, the only difference between the king of kings is that article, the, the one king, Jesus Christ, is the king. And so there's nothing wrong with saying, you know, I serve King Jesus. He is the king, the only one. There doesn't, no one else outranks him. The Lord of lords, you know, the master of all, um, all those who have power or authority in this world, he far outranks them. Um, and you see that same concept over in Revelation chapter 1 and in verse 5, um, where he's described as being a uh, prince. Uh, ba -ba -ba. And from Jesus Christ, who is a faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead, the prince of the kings of the earth. Now, in my feeble head, I think of prince, I think a tier below the king, right? You know, the son's got to be. But this word prince really just means the first, the preeminence, the first of the kings, the most preeminent among the kings. He outranks them all, right? Unto him that loved us, washed us from our sins in his own blood, and hath made us kings and priests unto God and his father. So when he adopted us into his family by his sacrifice and made, you know, made us worthy by his righteousness, he made us kings and priests in the same way that, you know, the little girl wants the prince to come marry her and she can be a princess. He has come and made us royalty with him. You are now in the royal family as a adopted child of God by the work of Jesus Christ. All right. And let's just go to one last one. This is Revelation over in chapter 19. Um, and I'm just going to read a little bit. Um, it says, After these things, I heard a great voice of much people in heaven saying, Alleluia. Uh, alleluia or hallelujah means praise be Jehovah, praise to God. Right? Salvation and glory, honor and power unto the Lord our God. For true and righteous are his judgments. For he hath judged the great whore, Babylon, which did corrupt the earth with her fornication, and hath avenged the blood of his servants at her hand. And again they said, Alleluia, praise be to God. And her smoke rose up forever and ever. Four and twenty elders and the four beasts fell down and worshiped God that sat on his throne, saying, Amen. So let it be, or truly, Alleluia. And a voice came out of the throne, saying, Praise our God, all ye his servants, and ye that fear him, both small and great. And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude, as the voice of many waters, the voice of many thundering, saying, Alleluia. For the Lord God, omnipotent, all-powerful, reigneth. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him, for the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife hath made herself ready, and to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. And so we get this kind of cool picture when you get to this, this bride um, of, the, of the Lamb, and it's obviously Jesus, and you can read on the rest of that chapter to see um, the description of Christ there, but I'm just going to go back to Ephesians chapter 5 and just read um, those couple of verses um, that I alluded to earlier. It says, Husbands, this is Ephesians 5 25, husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle, or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So men ought to love their wives as their own bodies. And so he has taken and taken a very unclean thing, which is what we were, and you know, collectively all of his people, and made them clean without spot or wrinkle, and then is presenting it to himself, uh, to his bride. Um, and, you know, Maybe the idea of thinking about the heavenly husband is just too, too strange for you, but maybe it would be better to think in terms of, of, um, of submission, of who do you report to. Right? Um, over in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 11, 
And in verse 3, it says, But I would have you know that the head of every man is Christ. The head of the woman is the man, and the head of Christ is God. Right? So the same way that in our marriages, the, the, the husband is the, the leader of the family, um, by that same token, we are subject um, to our head, which is Christ. Um, he is in, in that same relationship, like our, our husband, who we report to and who we have to um, answer to. Uh, anyway, those are just a few thoughts on our uh, heavenly husband, who's rich and kind and gentle and a protector, um, a prince, um, smart, handsome. Anyway, so those are my